adaptive trials. Now, what about financially adaptive trials? By financially adaptive trials, I essentially mean uh, if you just look at trials as they are, financial, but, uh, sorry, adapt, uh, clinical trials for research, but we work out the financial implications of these. So we, look, we, we explicitly recognize that there are, there's an financial impact of these trials. And that is, for example, obvious ones like cost, but then net present value, uh, risk to the company. These are other factors which are not really connected with the design. It's as, as if this is sort of independent of the design. And my emphasis is to say that these two are really, they're just one and the same looked at from different angles. And fortunately, adaptive designs are very flexible. So they allow you, the key thing they allow you to do uh, compared to traditional deny is to have many variants. And variants, the more variants you have, the more ability you, you have to make trade-offs because these are never simple. There's always uh, conflicting objectives you want to balance out. And I, here's a picture of uh, <clears throat> what I mean. And so if, a, if you're looking at the from a financial perspective, you look at a clinical trial, these are the problems, expensive, slow, risky, you don't know what's going on in there, the molecule locked up, because once you put the money in, it's done. And these reduce the appeal of this R&D investment. Uh, and we have financial, choice, financial choices. We want to be fast, we want to cut costs. And these are obviously in conflict. If you want to, for example, if you increase the number of sites, then you can increase the speed, but then your cost goes up. Or you want to increase the probability of success, but you want to also have an early read so that you don't get locked in with too much capital. You can get out of the trial if it's not an effective drug. Uh, but then again, as we know from statistics, if you're gonna keep the same sample size and uh, uh, have it control our type one error as the FDA would have us, uh, we, can't, we can't have it both ways. It's going to, if you want, you'll have to increase the sample size if you want to preserve the power. So all these are sorts of adjustments that are trade-offs that are typically not made, typically, uh, certainly not with a financial perspective on them. Uh, and I'll take, uh, when I say going from the theoretical to the practical, I mean talking about case studies, and I'll really have time mostly for just one because I have a very short time, uh, the first one, but I'll briefly touch on the second one as well. And the first one actually connects up to Sunesis. You heard a little bit about Sunesis this morning from Adam Craig. Uh, it's, a, it's about managing risk and cost. You know, how can we make our trial more uh, investable? That was the, the main argument here. And uh, <clears throat> the situation is the following. It's a small biotech. It has a pivotal trial. It's a lead asset limited resources, and they were looking for possibly a possibility of investment. And they'd like to somehow have some sort of staged investment where when they need the money, they get it, and otherwise they don't take it. And they want to be able to communicate that risk-reward system to the investor so that it's relatively transparent, that what, the, what are the risks and returns to the investor. And this, I won't bother you with all the pictures, but it's basically ultimately just a, it's an oncology drug. It's a for refractory AML. Uh, it's a Velour study. Uh, so typical two-arm two trial. And um, it, it's the traditional sort of trial where you, you just have a sufficient power if you have enough sample size. And uh, the traditional design uh, was for, they expected the hazard ratio to be 0 0.71. And for 90% power, it was 450 uh, patients they could accrue uh, and have observed 375 events to get that power. And that was fine, except that they had this uh, feeling that perhaps uh, they're being optimistic and maybe it would be the hazard ratio would not be quite so good. And what happens then? Well, then it's not so nice because then the power drops quite a bit to points to 70%. And in order to get 90% power, you will have to increase the sample size quite a bit, 60%, and that seemed financially sort of out of their reach. So they wanted to avoid this high cost, but they wanted to avoid it. If they had to do it, they were willing to do it. So in a sense, that's what the whole idea was, that if, if our drug is really good, then we shouldn't be taking much money. We shouldn't be paying too much for 
some partner, but then if it's that partner should be a cushion in case I don't, we don't achieve that uh, objective. And so can we make an adaptive design? And that was the main challenge to us as an adaptive designer. And this is the design we came out with, which is basically take the very same design they had in mind, but have an interim analysis. And in that interim analysis, we calculate something called the conditional power, which is the, given the data you've seen so far, what is the chances that with the existing sample size you'll have significance? So it's just how much, how well of you are. If you've got a trend which is very high, then you would have a high conditional power. Otherwise, you would have a low conditional power or something in between. And then you have, you have to, this is part of the design, you have to have levels of this observed e efficacy at that point uh, and some cutoffs. So if it's very high, then you know that you will essentially be able to show significance with whatever sample size you already have. If it's very low, there's no point going any further. That's the bottom part here. And if it is uh, in between a promising zone, which is quite good, then we should, it, it's good, but it's not adequate. Our original sample size is not adequate. We need to increase it. In this case, the design is increased by 50% in that case. So in that blue, blue colored area, you can see uh, that's what you would do. And in the other two, the favorable, unfavorable, you just continue and go to the planned end. You would not do anything to the sample size. Okay, so that's basically what the design was. And you can see that in a sense, it breaks it up into sort of less different segments which are more risky. And that gives us a chance to negotiate with investors in terms of what you get from different, uh, uh, different achievements at that interim. And this is the result of uh, some simulations that we did with those uh, hazard ratios that they were concerned about uh, with that particular design. If you have an early stopping, so, so remember 0.71 was what they expected. They thought that was that they should be able to do, but they were just a little worried about 0.77. And uh, it turns out the problem of power at 0.77 hazard ratio, which was 70%, they're able to get 80% with this. Of course, this is the cost of an increased average sample size if HR is the, you know, the hazard ratio is the level that was expected, 0.71, then you see it's 490, it's a higher sample size than the 450 that we had before, the expected sample size. But it has a correspondingly higher power, also 95%. So this seemed like something that balances out the requirements uh, in terms of uh, bringing the power up to the level they wanted for the, uh, for the, so, for the so the second level of hazard ratio achievement. And this, the main thing was the strategic impact of this was uh, quite remarkable because, because of this, they were able to, it essentially offers a stage investment to an investor. And an external investor, in this case, Royalty Pharma, uh, saw this trial as an opportunity to keep the risk return profile within the parameters that they were happy with. So for example, if you see those uh, four rows in that table, uh, efficacy, futility, promising zone, favorable, unfavorable, uh, those are the different, uh, different partitions of the values possible at the interim of the efficacy. And the decisions would be if it's efficacy, then stop recruiting. Uh, if you're futility, also stop recruiting, uh, stop for futility, but if it's a promising zone, increase the sample size. As I had mentioned, about 50% increase in sample size associated with 50% increase in events as well. And then the last is uh, the remaining favorable or unfavorable. Continue with what you originally planned. This, that's the reasonable route to take given the, what you've observed at the interim. And the interesting thing is the last column, which is the agreement they were able to strike with Royalty Pharma. That's the, that's the key. Uh, part of this, that now you have an external investor who is making investments which are more transparent to that investor than if you had said up front, here's a, here's a trial, please invest some money. Because you're now saying, I'm guaranteeing you that certain things, some hurdles have been passed in the trial. For example, you see that no payments under futility, which means that if they happen to get to the interim in this futility, all deals are off. And you can see that in the uh, efficacy, uh, they have a, a share. Uh, in the favorable and unfavorable, 
they have more than that share. They have not only that option to uh, what they have under efficacy, which is the early stopping. If they continue to their regular sample, uh, they get the same, except they also get uh, the option only if it's successful will they invest. So that's, that's how they got that. And then the uh, third one is the promising zone, the zone where they sort of wish they had known earlier and they would have had a larger sample size, that zone. Uh, because the increase in sample size is partial, partially possible because of royalties investment, uh, this 25 mile, million milestone investment, they get not only the royal, a higher royalty, but also some warranty. So that's a, you know, there was obviously lots of simulations and negotiations between the two parties, but it came out that there is a, a way to participate, a, a company which has a risk ratio which um, they're happy with, and a reasonable reassurance that they have an understanding of the risks, because the whole trial has been opened up and given to them on, they could ask questions and so on. So this was, uh, if you, this was just a, uh, what was the situation with this trial when they designed it for a hazard ratio of 0.77. For Sunesis, the company, uh, we had Adam Craig this morning tell, tell us about this trial actually. Uh, the power, it was increased from 70 to 80% as I mentioned. The odds of incurring a loss, making any loss at all, have gone from 41 to 25%. So they're better off. They also have overall revenue better over the, uh, next 10 years of 44 million. So they're better off than they were. Even if the hazard ratio is 0.77, they're okay. Whereas for Royalty Pharma, they have uh, odds of incurring a loss of 7%, and the internal return is 22%, which is kind of return they expect from other investments. So it seemed like a good deal, and uh, the comments of the partners, these are comments that I've taken from the press at the time that the uh, the partnership was announced. Uh, and you can see the Pablo Legoreta was very happy with this uh, deal. Uh, met him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's, he says it's a win-win for Sunesis and Royalty Pharma. We are able to invest in Wasserixen at a time when, it's, when we believe it's right for us to invest. And then uh, Steve Ketchum, who was at that time the senior VP R&D at Sunesis, says it's difficult to imagine doing something with it's non-adaptive traditional kind of trial. So this is one example I can illustrate of how one can look at a clinical trial as a, if in an adaptive casting, it enables options to be set up, various negotiation capabilities where, uh, for instance, increasing the futility can reduce the risk for an investor. Um, you, you could also avoid, in the company itself avoids having to give away everything as long as what they have in mind more or less works. They do have to give something up uh, as opposed to being independent, but not all of it. And they're much better off than uh, having to give away a lot. And so it's, a, it's kind of a fair deal if, it, if you're, uh, in a sense, if, if the efficacy is not what you expected, then you, you know, you're prepared to kind of give up more. But the second case study is a much shorter uh, study. And I mean, it's, I've, I've got it very short, which is really about a large pharma. Here the potential, what I want to really talk about is trade-offs more, um, uh, more specifically. Uh, this is a hypothetical asset. It's a niche asset, low probability of success, limited management guidance. Not much, to, they were not told much about what, how to go about it. And they had a range of options that they wanted to set up a set of options so they could talk with management. And they decided to, here's, I'm, I'm going, giving you only two of the adaptive designs, there were many more. They had a base case, which was a fixed design, a typical phase two, phase three, so oncology trial, um, overall survival kind of trial, a small niche product. And uh, you can see it takes a long time. There's a phase one, there's a gap between phase two, uh, phase two, there's phase two, phase three gap, then there's a phase three. And the other designs, the adaptive designs, one is with a single interim, and it's a combined trial. It's not a phase two, phase three, it's a combined phase two, phase three. So there's no white space between them, the two and three, the spaces, the recruitment continues continuously. And also it is uh, the, 
what in the traditional trial would be phase two subjects are included in the phase three uh, evaluations. Uh, so that's, that, those are the two major advantages. And then there's a third trial, uh, which is essentially, I'll, I'll show you that. It has an additional interim, and the logic for it is a little clearer in the next table, uh, <coughs> which represents a sort of summary of the, what the results are. So the top line is the base case. Um, it's got, uh, you know, uh, you can see the most dramatic things. The second line is uh, the single interim. And you can see there's a dramatic reduction in time from 74 months to 42 months on the average. And uh, correspondingly, of course, the net present value has gone up dramatically. Uh, the probability of success also is much higher. It's gone up from 59% to 75%. Uh, however, the cost of getting out is you get out earlier, 31 months, but the cost is higher. And that's because you've been recruiting all those months, whereas in the phase uh, in the traditional trial, you've not been recruiting all that time because this part of it is a gap in between. Uh, if you look at it from another point of view, which is to say, well, you know, we need to keep that first get out cost lower than this. It's, it's almost doubled, more than doubled. Uh, then you can consider a design in which you have two interims, one interim of which is such that it's early enough so that it stops at 17 months, much earlier than the 36 months of the base case, and incurs a cost that's about equal. And uh, the probability of success is, is matching. There's still an improvement over time, and certainly over NPV. So you can see the idea is not here that these are the ideal designs. It's how many uh, options you have about what you want to do. This is now an internal show. Uh, you know, how, how does the management feel about risking uh, capital of different amounts? What are they looking for? It enables a lot of, there's an alignment possible between you know, clinical uh, researchers and uh, financial, a CFO and CMO kind of alliance. So in fi finally, it's the summary is, I just look at the right-hand side the column there. Uh, integrated trial planning. The whole, whole idea here is, of course, it's, it's integrated between the financial models. I've, I've seen firms where there are a group of people who are doing financial modeling and a whole bunch of other people, typically they're under the CFO, a whole bunch of people working in this CMO. And what I'm suggesting is that if these two groups are able to come together, uh, some quite often these adaptive uh, approaches can be made valuable and sort of quantitatively valuable. You can say what are they worth and you can even open up investment possibilities from outside. I've been working also on programs, not on trial levels, again, blending financial modeling with clinical trial uh, designs, and also even portfolio level. Thank you very much.